So I want you guys to imagine a world where you're instantly connected with your technology as if you had telekinesis. Whether you're somebody who's differently abled or fully abled, you'd be able to interact, create, and innovate simply by thinking. Or what if your technology could feel what you feel and be able to react in a smart way, be able to help you overcome the challenges of life, and be able to optimize who you are as an individual? Well, this type of technology actually already exists, only it's trapped in a laboratory environment. It looks like this. Recording brain activity from outside of the brain is incredibly difficult. It's like listening to an out-of-tune radio. There's a lot of noise and static. And so what we do is we cover the person's brain with sensors. And then on top of that, we inject gel into each sensor itself. And you guys can imagine how horrible this experience is to try to control a computer when you have to have all the sensors on your head with gel on it. But in addition to that, brain-computer interfaces are also very slow. So I'm going to show you a picture, a video in the next slide where we actually show you what is considered state-of-the-art uh, golden standard brain computer interfaces. There's going to be a matrix in front of you and the matrix is going to have a series of letters and the person is going to focus on one of the letters and consciously want it. And it's going to type it and show it to you at the top of the screen. And I want you to see how slow this system is. So it's going to go through uh, and select the letter V. Now it's going to start the next cycle. And I want you to feel how slow this is. There you go. That was the letter I that they just typed. So you can imagine taking anywhere between 20 seconds to a minute to do one action. And this is the type of challenge that we had at the University of Michigan when I worked with children who had severe cerebral palsy. We wanted to be able to test them and give them the medical care that they required but you can imagine how if you're eight years old, you don't want to do this. So what we've done at Neurable is we have broke the performance barrier of brain-computer interfaces, allowing for the very first time a real-time brain-computer interface that can be used for the mass population. Uh, but instead of just talking to you about it, we're actually going to show you a demo. But the work that you're seeing today has been over eight years of work. Uh, National Science Foundation funded and now venture funded to bring this technology forward, not just for clinical applications, but also for daily use. And I'll be going through some of the use cases in just a second. Adam is finishing up the training process right now, and then we'll jump straight into it. But I do have time for one question, if you guys are bold to jump in right now. I don't know if this is easily answerable. How did you, um, I understand the reason for the gel in the like academic equipment is to facilitate the connection between like the skin and the sensors. So what did you like invent a new kind of sensor or? No, we are actually a signal processing company. So these sensors that he's using right now do not require any gel. He actually just put them on. It's all dry. And uh, basically, what we did is we invented, you know, I invented a, a technology that allows us to uh, take brain waves that we know that are, that are known brain waves and be able to classify them in real time. And that was the real significant breakthrough. So this is all done with machine learning. That's a great question. So I'm going to switch the HDMI ports. There we go. So Adam is just consciously wanting one of the objects on top of the screen and he's able to pull it. Uh, before we go into the actual experience, does somebody want to yell out one of these objects and we'll, we'll have them pick it real quick? Plane? All right, might not pick it up right now, but we'll see. You might have to wait for one more cycle. We, we already picked the plane. <laughs> He'll go for the beach ball next. Now, we're not using any eye tracking or voice tracking or any of, of that kind of uh, tech. Oh, no. <laughs> we'll try the beach ball next.
<laughs> All right, one more try. So it was working beautifully before we threw them up here. But we're going to go through the experience. So in this experience, Adam does not have any hand controllers or any type of controllers available to him. And he's going to just use his brain activity to interact with the objects. So there is a, he's in a virtual reality environment. He can look around. And what he can do is he can focus on one of the objects. Don't move your head too fast. People are going to get nauseous and he's able to just consciously focus on one and be able to bring it to himself as soon as he wants it. There you go. And anything that he wants to throw it at, he's able to focus and throw it on simply by consciously wanting. Now, this is a little puzzle he's supposed to get through. There we go. That's the escape room key and he can type with it. Now, what's really cool about this tech is we actually have a system for typing, uh, but even just using the normal selection system that we have, he's able to just consciously want the numbers he wants to click on, and he's able to navigate through the environment. Now, this is a really important uh, thing that a lot of our clients talk to us about, which is navigating through 3D environments. Teaching people how to use VR controls is a, is a very difficult thing for some of the workers that they have, uh, but you can see Adam was just simply wanting to move to where that silhouette was, and then it instantly teleported him. Now this is a really cool part. You see these lasers coming at Adam. Uh, as long as he consciously want them, we're able to click on them. His brain actually gave us four distinct click signals. And if he's really good, he can decide to click on three out of the four lasers, four out of the four lasers, because the brain is not limited to how many interactions it can do simultaneously. And this is really something spectacular. And you can see we're not using any type of cursors or anything like that. Cursors are actually what we create because we don't have a good way of translating thought into action. So we need to create these secondary systems like mouse and keyboards in order to translate what we want into action. So we don't need any of that. Uh, as long as he wants it, we're able to do it. And then in this next part, he has to battle this dog that's going to attack him. And all he has to do is consciously want to transform parts of his body. We're able to capture that. And as soon as we capture that brain signal, we, we trigger the action. There you go. Awesome. All right, I'm going to take you out of the experience now. So there you guys go, a real-time brain-computer interface. Can you give it up for Adam, please? So like I said, we've been doing this for about uh, eight years. We started in 2011 with a 64 electro gel cap. So sensors just like the one I showed you previously, except for this is when we first discovered we could go to real-time analysis of brain data. That was a revolution. That was a zero to one step in technology. From there, we've spent the last eight years perfecting the technology and trying to tackle three key problems. One is form factor. You can't make this into a scalable solution until you reduce the form factor. Two is removing gel, which is what we did in 2015. Uh, and then moving forward is starting to get integration into products that exist right now. So this is a virtual reality system. We actually need two out of the six sensors now, uh, where we're at right now technologically. And moving forward, we're looking to integrate this into even more ubiquitous technology. So imagine a future where you put on a pair of headphones, Apple AirPods, glasses, and those become your control sources for brain-computer interface value propositions. That is the future that we're creating with Neurable. And why does this matter? Well, with every major computing modality, there has been an equal evolution in human technology. So for the computer, we had the mouse and keyboard. For the, touch phone, uh, uh, for the phone, what made it ubiquitous was the touch screen. And now that we enter augmented reality, we need effective computing and telekinesis to create that zero learning curve, full interface that creates what people have been imagining for such a long time. 
And there's a lot of companies that are working with brain computer interfaces, this is some of our partners, and I'm just gonna cover a few of the big things that they're doing with our technology to create the next generation that you guys are gonna see for human interfaces. So one big area is hands-free control. Uh, so a lot of our companies that we're working with in manufacturing use augmented reality to help people go through steps in assembling something, for example, a plane. Uh, but they need to use their hands, so they can't wave the screen around and try to click things with their fingers. What if they could just think, go to the next step, and then they could just follow along directly? They get a call from their manager and they can just think, answer. That's the kind of technology that we're enabling. Also, cognitive analytics. Uh, this is something that uh, we're working with with a lot of groups, including uh, some groups that work with military. So what if we could understand stress and other types of emotional information so that we can create a more robust, a, more, a stronger individual, or help them overcome some of the difficulties of life? Right? This is really the first tool that can allow for deep empathy with another individual. And that's such a powerful thing to bring forward. And lastly, it's employee training. So we're working with a lot of groups that, uh, that uh, do very high risk uh, applications, for example, changing a transformer. And what we wanna do is prevent people from losing their lives from going out there too early. So imagine putting somebody inside a scenario in virtual reality, having an expert go through it, and then have a novice go through it, and not allowing the novice to graduate until they are able to match the same brain patterns as an expert. And then that way we know for sure that when they're going out there, they're trained and they're ready, and they're not gonna put themselves in a dangerous situation. And then scaling this forward as we become even more mobile, we can now have this technology wearable when the employee goes out onto the field, we can see their stress levels, we can be there in case they're feeling fatigue, and we can create that safety layer that right now doesn't exist. But this isn't just important within enterprise, it's gonna go even beyond that into your house, into your home. So I'm going to start with a very simple example. Something as simple as turning on a light. So right now, to turn on a light, we do the following. We think, hey, it's dark right now. I need to turn on the light. And then we generate a ton of information through that thought. And like I said, we use secondary systems to interact with our technology. But what that really does is it reduces all this rich information into just one small stream, for example, a button click that turns on the light. Well, in the future, we can do so much more with that information. In the future, what we think and what we feel can communicate with a deeper and larger flow of communication. And instead of just turning on the light, we can say, hey, let's turn on a green light and let's turn on a soothing musical track because Ramses is feeling stressed out from work today. And that makes me feel better and live better in my life. But there's even bigger applications, for example, voice assistance. Right now we take voice data directly, and let's say I want to order a pizza, I say order a pizza, and sometimes it gets it wrong, and it says ordering pasta, right? And so two things I can do there, I can run and unplug the Google Home before it orders me some cheap pasta from Boston, because I'm from Boston, or two, you know, I'm just going to eat really crappy food. But what's really amazing is with the brain, there's actually a brain wave associated to understanding language when, it gets some, when something you hear is incorrect. So you can order a pizza, you can say ordering a pizza, and there's actually this brain wave called the P600 that we can pick up, and it'll tell us where in the sentence the error is and what type of error it is. And so then our voice assistants can say, Sorry, I meant pizza. Without taking out your phone, without changing anything that you do in your life, just naturally using the entire communication that we have and creating a feedback loop between you and your technology. The easiest way to think of what we're doing is we are creating the shortest distance between you and your technology. And that's how we get to here. A ubiquitous future where technology is seamlessly integrated into your life, where everything is, just happens because you want it, and we're able to provide information or reduce the information that you're connected to based off of what your brain is telling us. And we call this a world without limitations. And that's really the future that we at Neurable are building. Thank you very much. When is this coming out? What's the timeline for production? Yeah, we already have partners that are working with our tech uh, full time. Uh, so if you're lucky enough to be our partner, then it's already there. If not, uh, we're really focused on making sure that the product will be ready for consumers uh, in, in the next few years. Uh, and it's going to be even more uh, lightweight and incredible than what we're showing today. Thank you.
when, uh, when everything goes well, what the bandwidth of extraction of information from the brain to your system currently? Oh, what are the limits of what we can get from the brain to our system yeah. currently? No, what, what the bandwidth? How much information per uh, minute do you manage really, to get? Really, it's actually very simple, high-level information. Uh, the brain sensors that we record record from outside of the head, so there's no surgical techniques or anything needed. So it's very rough information. But with machine learning, you can make inferences off of that. That can be really... You can think of it as machine learning right now. AI is not going to dramatically change everything around us, but it's going to create such an environment that it makes it feel magical when you use it. And that's a similar thing that we get from the brain. Using AI, we can make it feel like it's providing you a lot of data, a lot of information, but really it's very gross information that we're picking up. Hey, um, so from watching your demo, it kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, but it kind of felt like you were just interpreting like a single binary input from the brain. Like, it would be the same as if I was holding a single button and I just hit the button at the right moment. Is that, is that kind of how it works? Yes. And we do have other systems that we're working on that are more analogous. But right now, the reason we show this system is because it shows you the power of a computer mouse. Right? So a computer mouse can only really do one thing, which is click a single button. And you can see how ubiquitous and useful that tool is. So right now, the demo that you saw is that. Yes. Uh, as a f as kind of follow-up. Um, is it possible to get like more than one binary input with the system? Yes. Cool. Hi, I think you just touched on this briefly um, about the non-invasive signals being rough and invasive signals, of course, being a lot better resolution. What are your thoughts on, you know, kind of really solving that problem with invasive signals being much better than non-invasive ones? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a problem that, uh, that necessarily needs to be, like, we never have to be as good as inv invasive signals, right? Invasive signals are something that are going to be uh, needed much farther along in the future. I think that with non-invasive signals, we can provide so much value now that, uh, and, and it's never going to happen, like non-invasive signals will never be as good as invasive signals. Uh, so surgical versus non-surgical. But that's not what we're trying to achieve. Um, so humans are fundamentally language animals. You know, by about two, three years old, we're, we're, we're learning a language, we're taking advantage of a language, but we're constrained by a language. So if the language lacks a word, we often lack the concept. Is there a way to get beyond the constraints of a language using this technology? That's a great question. So high level is, is there a way to get beyond the constraints of a language, especially with communication? Because you lose so much of it when you're communicating with another. Uh, the simple answer is yes. Even the fact that we are giving information to something as simple as a light bulb, to turn on music, to turn on a different shade of, of, of green light, for example, that's the most basic form of going beyond just pure verbal information. And you can imagine how if we allow others to gather some more emotional information, empathetic information from us, we can create even deeper connections with the people around us. Great. Thank you all, and we will be around for questions. Thank you so much.